Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fusionity Talks, a student-led webinar platform for sharing knowledge about nuclear fusion science and engineering. I'm Katarina, and today we have a very special guest, Daniel Medina, who also happens to be a member of our Fusionity Talks team. And today he will be speaking about pellet dynamics installator TJ2. Daniel was born and grew up in Madrid, in Spain, and he studied his Bachelor in Energy Engineering in University Carlos III of Madrid. And then he joined the Unity Master Program, during which he studied in the University of Lorraine in Nancy was his first year, and then in the University of Carlos III of Madrid for his second year. He recently graduated from his master's, and after completion, uh, of his master thesis on pilot injection in collaboration with CIMAP uh, in Madrid. He is now looking for a PhD position all around Europe. Daniel likes climbing and hiking in the nature, reading books and making international friends. And he hopes that he can make some of these today. Without further delay, I give the floor to Daniel. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Daniel Medina Roque and I will make a presentation about my master thesis, Studies of the Dynamics of Injecting Hydrogen Pellets in the Stellarator TE2. This work was done under the supervision of Nerea Panadero Álvarez and Kiran McCarthy in collaboration with the Laboratorio Nacional de Fusión in CIEMAT. But first, let me give an overview of the talk. I will begin with the motivation behind pelleting injection and this work. I will continue with the background theory and the experimental setup used to get the experimental results, which will be then compared with the prediction from simulation. And I will um, finish with the extracted conclusions and some uh, lines of further work. But first, what is pellet injection? Pellet injection is the introduction in the plasma of very tiny bullets of cryogenic hydrogen, and it's currently the leading technique for quell fueling uh, since it's a it achieves uh, deeper fuel penetrations, which are critical for the steady state operation of future fusion reactors. However, experimental results in accelerators are not fully understood yet, and therefore further studies are required to optimize the pellet injector location and the pellet parameters. In this work, we will focus on the study of the pellet acceleration, which if could be exploited in a fusion reactor, to achieve uh, pellet penetrations closer to the plasma core. Here I have a small recording of the pellet in the TE2 accelerator where we can see the pellet and the homogenization of the material when the pellet is fully ablated. So I will start with uh, some theoretical background. Um, when the pellet enters the plasma, the pellet ablation process is started, which is the removal of the pellet material from the pellet surface due to the heat transfer from the background plasma. This material then from, forms a neutral cloud around the pellet whose outer layers began to ionize the so-called plasmoid and start uh, expanding along the magnetic field lines. Both plasmoid and the neutral cloud uh, constitute a shielding cloud that protects the pellet be, uh, via these three mechanisms from further interactions with the plasma. In this way, the pellets are able to survive for longer times and therefore to penetrate deeper into the plasma. However, the final pellet material deposition in the plasma depends on several additional mechanisms. This material homogenization process is mainly governed by the, by the plasmoid parallel expansion that, that lasts until the plasmoid and the, pressure, and the plasma pressures are equilibrated. Uh, during this expansion, and due to the movement of charges inside an inhomogeneous magnetic field, uh, the um, ions and electrons have a different uh, nabla bit drift. And this current is compensated by the polarization of the, of the plasmoid. Uh, due to this process, the plasmoid experiments an E cross B drift, whose acceleration uh, can be calculated according to these formulas. In Tokamaks, there are three well known drift acceleration damping processes. Uh, however, in accelerators, since this process is strongly dependent on the magnetic configuration, this process is more complex and is not fully understood. In addition, pellets have been observed to be deflected in the um, radial, toroidal, and ampoloidal directions, 
And this is believed to be caused by an unbalanced plate ablation between both sides of the pellet that leads to acceleration via rocket effect in the direction opposite to the overablation. Some possible sources of this, of this unbalanced ablation uh, are the asymmetries in the electron and ion distribution functions and significant plasma currents. And it is also believed that the plasmoid E cross B itself could, be, could cause this unbalanced ablation. Here, we have the typical example of a low field side injection of a pellet in a tokamak, where the plasmoid drifts toward, towards the low field side of the machine. This leads the high field side to be less efficiently protected by the plasmoid, and therefore it will be overablated. And this will lead to acceleration via rocket effect towards the low field side of the machine. In contrast, if we have high field side injections, this process will be reversed and the pellet will be pushed towards the plasma core. Uh, since this is very interesting for a fusion reactor, two main models have been developed uh, to calculate the pellet acceleration according to these two formulas. The first principal model, which believes that the source is indeed the plasmoid drift, and the semi-empirical model, which introduces a, a, an asymmetry, a pressure asymmetry, uh, as a source of this acceleration. Then I will continue with an explanation of the uh, experimental setup. And I use the TE2 accelerator, which is a medium size uh, four period uh, device uh, and is characterized by, by a beam shaped plasma cross section and high flexibility due, due to the achievement of a wide range of rotational transforms. Uh, the TE2 accelerator has two main heating methods the electron cyclotron resonance heating and the neutral beam injection. In addition, I use the TA2 pellet injector, whose schematic is shown here. And it's a four barrel pipe gun with four different pellet sizes and four different injection lines. It, it allows the in situ pellet formation at 10 Kelvin, thanks to the cryo cooler, and the acceleration up to velocities of 1200 meters per second, thanks to the propellant valves. In addition, it has two very important inline diagnostics, which are the light gate and the microwave cavity which allow to measure the pellet mass and the injection velocity. In addition, we have the TJ2 photodiode system, where silicon photodiodes are located at the top and side viewports, and they allow to follow the temporal evolution of the uh, pellet H-alpha emission. And in this, in this manner, we can uh, estimate the pellet position, the ablation rate, and the pellet penetration depth of the pellets. To conclude, I also use the TA2 fast camera system, uh, which was recently upgraded with a double bundle fiber that allows the simultaneous recording from top and tank with viewports, which is tangential to the pellet flight path. And therefore, it allows the observation of the three dimensional uh, pellet trajectory. Uh, I will continue with the experimental results, and I will begin with the effect that a pellet has on, a, on the plasma with a representative discharge. Here we can clearly see that when pellets, pellets are injected, uh, there is a significant drop in the electron temperature here in red and an increase in the electron density. And this is a transient effect uh, whose duration depends on the plasma parameters before injection. From now on, we will focus on the pellet two uh, in different discharges. But uh, clear to the uh, before the analysis, uh, we have to estimate to establish an accurate uh, correlation between the pixels in the image and the real position inside the TJ2 vacuum vessel. And for that, we use uh, two optical windows as a references. Uh, that allow us to, to, to elucidate where, the, where is the plasma edge and the, and the center of the plasma. In addition to this, we use a test card of known sizes and distances to elucidate the spatial resolution of the, of the camera. When this is done, we can estimate the pellet position, filtering the images to 80-95% of maximum light intensity, since the pellet is assumed to be located in the area of maximum light intensity in a recording. And then the pellet position is calculated by two different methods. The first one is the calculation of the centroid according to this formula, 
And the second one is a Gaussian fitting of the light intensity profile in the record. Since both methods are normally in agreement, as we can see here, uh, the, we can conclude that the pellet is generally well localized. And if we repeat this process for different frames in a recording, we can calculate the full pellet trajectory. Uh, here we have the toroidal, vertical, and radial positions of the pellet at its instance of time. And again, thanks to the double bundle, we can make some final um, corrections of the calculation and the full width half maximum of the of the vertical Gaussian fit from, from top is used to estimate the plasmoid toroidal expansion and this is used to estimate error bars in the pellet trajectory from tank and similarly this vertical pellet deflection of surfing tank is used to correct the pixel size equivalence in the top uh, viewport. Uh, then from these pellet trajectories, uh, we can calculate the, the pellet accelerations. Uh, and, but for that, some prior assumptions are needed. The first one is that the toroidal acceleration is assumed negligible since there is no toroidal plasmoid drift. And this assumption is confirmed here. We can see that there is mainly no acceleration. Uh, then the initial toroidal and poloidal velocities are assumed zero since the inject injection velocity is purely radial. And finally, uh, the radial and poloidal acceleration are assumed constant during the whole pellet lifetime. So a uh, second degree polynomial fitting is done to the experimental observations to calculate the acceleration. Here we have the typical upward acceleration of the pellet, but uh, with the radial acceleration, uh, sometimes positive and negative accelerations were observed. And this is believed to be caused by, by an error in the analysis, since there are no significant changes in the discharges that could explain this completely opposite behavior. So the study of the dependencies will all, only be done with the vertical acceleration. When we study the dependencies on the main pellet parameters, which are the injection velocity and the pellet uh, mass, we discovered that it slightly increases with the injection velocity and uh, increases with the, with the pellet mass. And when we compare with the main plasma parameters representing the physics governing the pellet ablation and homogenization process, uh, we discovered that the, the vertical acceleration clearly decreases with the electron density and it also decreases with the central electron temperature. However, this second observation is in contrast with the fact that the plasmoid drift is increased for larger pressure difference. So we believe that uh, the, the uh, central electron temperature was incorrectly measured during this experimental ca campaign due to uncertainties in the Thomson scattering profiles. I will continue with the comparisons with the simulations. And for the simulations, we use the hydrogen pellet injection to code, which is a well-known code to simulate the ablation and homogenization processes of the pellet that was recently validated for TJ2 and Belderstein 7X, and also recently extended to simulate the pellet acceleration in accelerators, according to the previous mentioned models, the semi-empirical and the first principle models. Here we can see the, the TJ2 uh, being plasma cross section. And here we have the simulation of the pellet trajectory according to the three different cases. When the acceleration is calculated by the semi empirical model, by the first principle model, and when no acceleration is considered. First, I will compare the, uh, the prediction of the ablation rate uh, from the code with the uh, light like with the H alpha emission profiles. Uh, captured by the photodiode system and the fast camera system. We can conclude here that very similar ablation profiles are found and uh, also penetration depths. And also it can be concluded that there were no significant changes in the predicted ablation rate when the acceleration is considered. And to conclude, I will con 
I will uh, compare the experimentally observed trajectories with the predictions uh, with the model. We can conclude that the radial anthroidal positions are relatively well reproduced uh, by in the three cases, while the, um, the vertical pellet deflection is underestimated by the semi-empirical model and predict completely in the opposite direction but the first principle model. If we go to the velocity, we find that the observed decrease in radial velocity is predicted by both models, while the increase in vertical velo velocity is again underestimated by the semi-empirical model. And going finally to the acceleration, we found that the observed negative and constant radial acceleration is better reproduced by the first principles model, while the upwards uh, velocity vertical acceleration is again underestimated by the semi-empirical model. I will conclude with the extracted conclusions and some lines of further work. So the main extracted conclusions were that the assumption of negligible toroidal acceleration was confirmed, while the hypothesis of constant radial and vertical accelerations was found to be invalid. The upward uh, vertical pellet accelerations uh, were systematically observed which seems to be more pronounced for larger pellet into less dense and cooler plasmas. And the experimental, and it can be also concluded that the experimental observations are relatively better reproduced by the semi-empirical model. Some lines of possible further work is to extend this analysis during MBI heating and to other non axis symmetric, symmetric devices to improve the estimation of the radial acceleration to be able to repeat the study of the dependencies, also to improve the statistics of the dependency analysis of the vertical acceleration, and finally to find an optimized value of the pressure asymmetry parameter for the TA2. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting and informative talk. Uh, and now it's time for questions. I already see that Philip Paposhek uh, wants to ask something. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your nice talk. I enjoy it very much. I want to ask you a question. Uh, okay. Do you have any guess or do you know why the experimental observations were so, well, not that well reproduced by the first uh, principal model, that it even went the opposite direction than, than your experimental observations? Yes, this is, this is a very uh, critical question and it really goes to the point where the, this research, is, I mean, the current state of this research. And as I mentioned in this slide, the, the, um, yes, the plasmoid cross B drift is believed to be a, a cost of this pellet acceleration. And it's exactly the, the, um, the source that is introduced in this model that is not very accurate. But it's true that the same observations are, are found in the in tokamaks. So in tokamaks, also the semi-empirical model, which basically it's semi-empirical because it's uh, it's it's based on the semi-pressure asymmetry parameter that better fits the experimental rich results. So yes, I can I can tell you that. Uh, since it's a semi-empirical model, it's normal that it fits better the semi-empirical results and that the conclusions of this, of this project are in agreement with observations in other institutes that the semi-empirical model represents better than the first principles. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, this is your master thesis and uh, I know there might be some uh, master students from PhD program now in the audience. So I would like to ask you if uh, you could share what was the most challenging uh, task uh, in your research. <laughs> and maybe you could give some advice uh, to younger students uh, how to succeed in your master thesis. Yes, thank you. So my mainly, because also some students might be very experimentally focused uh, as I find myself. And I have to say that uh, the most challenging uh, aspect for me was to <laughs> jump in from the master 
lessons to the real life and and mainly in the experimental work where things that are not expected to go wrong <laughs> go definitely wrong and i can say that here I have one further work that is to extend this analysis to the MBI heating. And actually this end up being a further work, but it, in the beginning, it was the basis also of this project. We wanted really to study during both heating methods, but in the end, the experiments during MBI heating were completely didn't make any sense. The, pellet were, the pellets were just exploding when entering the plasma and we could not do it so my my advice is <laughs> be ready to change your your goals because sometimes experiment don't go the experiments don't go as expected i see thank you very much thank you